So good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Uh, we thank all of you guys for being with us here today. This is the kickoff of the second hangout of our new season. Uh, we are starting the entire month of September with Ocean Plastics Hangouts, and we've got a really great speaker today. Before we get to her, I'm going to do a little bit of a shout out for each of the classes. So we've got Miss Weber's grade fives from West Jefferson, Ohio. O -H -I, -O. I love it. <laughs> we've got Miss Olivetti's class, grade fours from San Antonio, Texas. Hi guys. We've got Mr. Hollis's grade fours from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Grade nine. Grade nine. Grade nines. <laughs> grade four. Much voice. There we go. We've got Mr. Miss uh, Caracas's uh, grade sevens from Brampton, Ontario. Hi, guys. <laughs> and then, with all the mic firmly muted, we've got Miss Hubble's grade fives from Virginia Beach, in Virginia. The few that are here, they're coming. There are more. <laughs> we've got Miss Anderson's grade fives in Burlington, Ontario just her but they're there and last but not least we've got miss presley's grade threes in virginia beach hi guys there's so many of you hi. all right of course the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker we are joined live from toronto ontario canada as i am as well uh by dr kelsey rockman who is one of the first people to really study and sound the alarm about marine plastic pollution she has taken her research and turned it into a role in advocacy. She has spoken for the U.S. State Department, the U.N., and many others on the issue. And so we're so, so happy to have her with us today to kick off our month. Chelsea Rockman, thank you so much for joining us and take it away. All right. Well, good morning, you guys. Um, I'm going to share a screen in a minute, which is going to be my PowerPoint. And I'm just going to walk you through basically how I became interested in plastic pollution, a little bit about the issue what we can do to help. And I'm going to try to wrap that all up in 20 to 25 minutes so that we have lots of time for questions. But before I switch screens, I just want to say thank you for signing on and thank you for being interested in this topic. I also got interested in this topic when I was young um, about your ages, but really, really interested when I went to the university and learned more about it. So hopefully, um, you stay interested in this topic and try to do what you can do in your own homes and with your friends and in your own life to try to help this issue. So I'm going to change my share my screen and then Jesse, I'm going to look to you to tell me if it's working. I, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be yet. It. Hopefully, is now. Yep, you're good. You can see just the big slide. Just the slide. Okay. So for those of you that are local in Ontario, this picture is actually some trash that I took at Humber Bay Park West at the end of Mimico Creek. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is not necessarily local plastic pollution, but I just want to note that we do, of course, have local plastic. And so this issue is a global issue. I'm sure lots of you guys have been to beaches or parks or even just your neighborhood streets and seeing plastic litter or any type of litter on the ground. And all of that contributes to this issue. But for me, I got interested in this issue because I heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So by a show of, and I can't hear hands, so, so yes, voices, can you tell me how many of you guys have heard of the North Pacific Garbage Patch or the Great Garbage Patch? I'm demuting a few classes for you. So, Ms. Weber, Mr. Ho Mr. Hollis's class, have you guys heard of it? We got some hands. Hands in all the classes. Yeah, a few of us. A few of us. Okay. Yeah. So, and I think less, than, so it used to be that this was kind of the thing people talked about when they talk about plastic pollution. So, when I was in college, in undergrad, I read this article in the Los Angeles Times, which was introducing this idea of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch to the world. And the way that it was described is this big floating island of plastic trash twice the size of Texas. And so the way it was described, you'd picture something like this picture here. This used to be the picture that would come up when you Googled Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The reality is 
this is the Baltimore Harbor. This is not the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but it got a lot of people interested in this issue. Now, for me at the time, I was living in San Diego and one of my favorite beaches that was down, um, so San Diego, California, the very south borders uh, Tijuana, Mexico. And right on that border, we share this big estuary. And in this big estuary that we share, it looks like this. And so for me, I was thinking about plastic pollution from a local standpoint in one of my favorite places to go look at birds, go swimming in the ocean, knowing that we had this issue. So I got really interested in the issue. I volunteered for organizations that were working on it. And I decided I'm going to become a scientist. And the reason is because if I become a scientist, I can help us better understand the issue. And then I can help use that information to inform decision making or management strategies or solutions to this growing problem. So in my first year of graduate school, I had an opportunity to go to the garbage patch on a research cruise led by the Scripps Institution of Oceanography out in San Diego on this boat, the New Horizon or this ship. And our trip was called CPLEX. And to be honest, I can't even remember what it stands for anymore because this was almost 10 years ago, um, but it stands for something about plastic expedition. And uh, we were gonna go out to see what this garbage patch really looked like. We had no idea. We had heard stories about floating islands of garbage, but we wanted to go see for ourselves on the first big scientific expedition to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So we set out on a ship. It was me and about 25 other people at sea for about three weeks. We went straight west from California. So if you think about a map from California or from the west coast, we just went straight out into the ocean for about a thousand miles. And then we came up back into Oregon. Our goal was to get into the garbage patch and sample it. What we would do is every four hours, we would throw a net over the side of the ship. We would tow it for 15 minutes and we would pick up as much plastic as we could. The reality is, was day after day after day, we would throw our nets overboard. We would drag our net for 15 minutes and we wouldn't really see anything in our net. And so we were starting to get bored. We were playing with squid on the side of the boat that we would find. We were looking at things with our flashlights at night, looking at bioluminescence. It was beautiful, um, but we weren't, we weren't seeing what we expected to find the plastic. And when we did see plastic, it often looked like this. So here we are in the middle of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. There might be a buoy. If we were sitting on a football field, there might be a buoy on one end of the football field. There might be a bottle right beside us. And there might be a drink tray uh, for um, like washing dishes in a boat on the other side of the football field. So we were seeing from some debris, but we just weren't seeing this island. And we thought, well, this is interesting. We keep dragging our nets and we keep dragging our nets. And then one day I'm sitting in the kitchen and I'm eating breakfast and all of us are eating breakfast in the galley of the boat. And there's some people upstairs. And if you look at this ship in the picture, you can see the front of the ship. And if you follow the blue line to the first bit of white and you go up, that's where you stand when you're on the bow looking out. And so we had some people standing there looking for marine mammals, looking for seabirds, and also counting the plastic as it went by. And all of a sudden, they call us all up to the bow. They call us all up to the front of the ship, and they say, everybody get up here. We need your help. And we thought, what is going on? And we go up to the top of the boat, and we look out, and the scene looks like this. Every little white fleck that you see is a piece of plastic debris. It looked like confetti of hundreds to thousands to millions of pieces of plastic floating around, and we couldn't possibly count them as we went by. And every single one of us stood back with our backs against the ship and just stared in awe of this issue, which was very different than it had been described. But as somebody who cares about wildlife, all of a sudden you know that from an ecological perspective, this small plastic debris has the ability to get into and to be eaten by almost every single species in the ocean. 
So for me, I study how plastic debris impacts animals. And for me, I will never forget this moment in my career because it made me think about the small stuff, which we call microplastic, and it made me think about how it impacts wildlife. And when you think about cleanup, how do you clean up all of the small, small pieces? So it really flipped the way that I thought about the issue. And of course, there were big pieces. We saw this net that you see here on the left, and there's lots of fish living under it and around it. So there were some big, those we call ghost nets because they're still fishing even though they're floating around. But the majority of what we saw were these small pieces that you see in this um, magnified image with little tiny mctofin or lantern fish in there. And these are the type of pieces that you see in the gut content of animals. And those are the types of pieces we were seeing off of the bow of the ship. So since that time, this was 10 years ago, uh, maybe nine to be exact, we've learned an awful lot about this issue. So how does plastic get so small and tiny like that? Well, the plastic that we have leaves the shorelines, right? So every little brown piece of land is a continent. The plastic that we use leaves our coastline or goes off of a ship if we litter from a ship and it follows the current patterns. And so if you follow those arrows, you can see that it takes you out into the middle of the ocean and they kind of circulate there. So the North Pacific garbage patch is that top one in between the United States and Asia. And so you can see how the plastic would get into this area. And then over time with sunlight, those big products of plastic, like the things we know and use, like water bottles and shampoo bottles and things like that, break down by the sun into smaller and smaller pieces. And so we now know that it's not just the garbage patch. There is plastic accumulating in all of those major open oceans, in all of these gyre systems where the currents come together. And we think that in the ocean, there are 15 to 51 trillion little pieces of these plastics weighing 93 to 236,000 metric tons, which is such a large number that it's really hard for us to even grasp. So the reality is that for plastic pollution, we have global contamination and that while some of it is big, a lot of it is big, this macro plastics, fishing nets and products that we use every day, the majority of those pieces are these tiny, tiny small bits of plastic that we saw off of the ship. And so now, about 10 years after I started researching this issue, we don't think about plastics as just in the garbage patch. And we don't think about plastics as big products of litter, even though they are, are. We think about these microplastics, this plastic dust, and we realize that they're kind of everywhere and it's become this global pollutant. And here, where I live in Ontario and where some of you live on the Great Lakes, and even if you're in Ohio, those of you in Ohio, depending on where you are, your watershed might lead to Lake Erie. So if we are on the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes also has this plastic pollution problem. So I do a lot of my work now here on Lake Ontario and in Lake Huron, and we know that plastic pollution is also quite common here. And in some cases, the amount is even greater because it's not dilute like the ocean, right? The oceans are all connected, the currents move around, whereas in the lake, you're a bit more isolated in this small body of water. So then this question is, if there's plastic everywhere, and I said it can get into the food chain, there's this question of has it. So when I started doing my work, I was mostly quantifying plastic pollution in different places around the world. And one of the places I quantified it in was seafood, and the other place that some people have quantified it in is sea salt. And the reality is that if plastic is getting into animals in the ocean, we know that plastic is getting into the animals that we eat. When we pull our water from the Great Lakes to make our drinking water, we know that plastic is getting into our drinking water. Now, does this mean you should stop eating water or seafood? No, we don't know what the effect is. And the amount that we're exposed to is likely pretty small. But the reality is what this means is that by not taking care of our trash or our litter or our materials properly at the end of life, that they've come back to us in our own food and our own water. 
So then you ask this question of how did we get here? So you guys are anywhere from, I think, fourth grade to ninth grade. Is that correct? So you have grown up always with using a lot of plastic in your daily life. So I encourage you just for a moment, just look around your classroom. You're probably sitting on a plastic chair. You're probably wearing plastic sneakers or tennis shoes. You likely have plastic in your clothing. If you have glasses on like I do, the frames might be made of plastic. And certainly this computer that I'm talking to you on is made of plastic. So the reality is it's this material, which is quite a good material in many ways, has become quite common in our daily lives. So how did we get here? Well, this is a picture from way before you were born, right around the 1950s, when plastic was starting to be invented as a material. And this is the cover of Life magazine, a magazine that I don't even know if they sell it anymore, but maybe they do. And somebody can tell me the answer when I'm done. <laughs> but this is a cover of Life magazine when we were producing only a half of a million pounds of plastic per year. So remember that number, a half of a million. And it was this idea trying to advertise this material to say, oh my gosh, we can produce this material made out of plastic and we can make these single use items like plastic forks and spoons and plates and cups, which I'm sure you've all drank and or eaten from. And then after we have our party, we can just throw them all away. We no longer have to do dishes and this is an amazing material. And today we've embraced this so much. Remember how much I said we produced then? A half a million tons, a half a million tons. I think I said pounds, a half a million tons. Now we produce 300 million. And so we produce a lot more plastic. And a lot of that are these single-use items. So if you have a water bottle, a single-use water bottle, a Ziploc bag in your lunch today, those are items that you're going to open up your food and you're going to eat it or you're going to drink your water. But after about a half an hour, you're going to throw it in the trash or the recycling. So it's a material that we use once, that's why they call it a single-use plastic, and then we're done with it. But those materials can last in the environment for quite a long time if they're not disposed of properly. So if we think about all of the plastic that we've produced from all of these years that we've been producing it, we have produced 6.3 billion metric tons globally by adding up all of the amounts that we've made every single year. And only 9% of that has been recycled, so into your blue bin. About 12% of that is incinerated, so sometimes that's waste to energy. And about 79% of that, most of it, either goes to landfills or out into the environment. So we talk a lot about recycling. But the reality is we recycle a small fraction of the amount of plastic we put on the planet. And of course, some of the plastic that we made is still in use. So this is just the plastic that we finished with and we've thrown away. So then when we are not taking very good care of these materials, we end up with images like this. So I'm sure all of you have been to a park or a beach where you see plastic litter, and I would encourage you to pick up that plastic litter and put it in the waste bin or the recycle bin at the park. So because of this plastic that goes into the environment, we think we, that 8 million metric tons of plastic enters the ocean annually. So if you mad, imagined everybody in the world holding a plastic grocery bag full of plastic litter, standing on every inch of coastline around the world, that would equal about 8 million metric tons of plastic. So quite a bit goes into the ocean. And so in my job, I see images like this quite a lot where I find plastic on the beach, in seagrass habitats, at the deep, in the deep sea, in ice cores from the Arctic, including our own Arctic, and in coral reefs. And I know from my work and other people's work that this plastic gets into lots of different types of animals. So we know that more than 800 species of wildlife either become entangled by plastic, eat plastic, or be smothered by it. So like a plastic that falls down onto your habitat. So we know that lots of animals are interacting with it and that it can cause impacts to wildlife. So what's a physical impact? 
So some of you have heard of fishing nets or ghost nets, which I talked about earlier. If they entangle an animal, that can be a physical impact. Then plastics are associated with lots of chemicals that are used to make them, so ingredients. And these ingredients can also be toxic if they're eaten by an organism. So over the course of my career, I have found <clears throat> that there is a lot of plastic pollution in habitats and animals, including the food that we eat. And there is some evidence of effects to wildlife. And I continue to do the science. Every day, I run a lab full of 25 people. And we continue to try to better understand how plastic gets into the ocean, the sources, like where does it come from, the fate, where does it go once it ends up in the ocean, does it move through the animals, does it sink to the deep sea, and then how it impacts us as well as animals. But the reality is that we also have enough information to start to mitigate, so to start to prevent plastic from going into the ocean and to start to clean it up. So I wanna talk a little bit before we stop about solutions. So for plastic, there is no silver bullet solution to plastic pollution. So yes, that rhymes, so you can always remember it. There is no silver bullet solution to plastic pollution. Um, and the reality is, I think there are many different solutions and actions that we can do at the same time to help prevent this issue. So on the country level policy and on the global level, we're starting to see our governments take action. So for those of you here in Canada, Catherine McKenna and Justin Trudeau are working hard on this issue. And on their this year, they've made lots of announcements as part of the G7 program to prevent plastic from going into the ocean by improving waste management and reducing some of the use of single-use items. In the United States, for those of you in the U.S., the United States was one of, if not the, I can't remember, first countries to ban plastic microbeads, those tiny little beads, from body washes and face scrubs. And that realization that that needed to be done came from some work done in the Great Lakes by a collaboration between both the United States and Canadian researchers. Then on a global level, there are international initiatives in this Sustainable Development Goal 14, this life below water, and the Clean Seas uh, commitments to reduce our use of plastic to also help this issue. Now, what are some things, what are some other things that we can do besides these big country level things? Well, there's lots of different types of solutions that we can work on. So I'm not going to go around this whole pie. Instead, I'm going to give you examples of what some of these are. So when I talked earlier about the little amount that is recycled and that big amount that goes to landfill, we can increase or improve our waste management infrastructure and have more of it just circulating in use so that a lot of it is not going out into the environment. We can also, don't read all this, I'm sorry for the slide, incentivize the return of fishing gear. So when fishermen go out and they're fishing, if they see a net lost on the bottom of a reef or floating around, they can pick it up and they can return it to the coastline and get paid for that. We can also stop using certain single-use plastic items. When we do beach cleanups, and this coming Saturday is International Coastal Cleanup Day, so I would encourage you to find a local cleanup and go clean up a park, a beach, somewhere in your neighborhood or in your area. We find a lot of these single-use items like grocery bags and beverage bottles and caps and straws. And this is why you hear people talk about banning the use of straws or getting rid of the use of straws. Some of these things that are not necessary for everybody, right? So maybe not banning them completely, but not having them be so available because they end up often in our environment. I'm going to skip around a little bit because I want time for questions. So here is the cleanup. So I just want to say, so we can clean up on the beaches. We can clean up in the middle of the ocean. So some of you might be aware that there's a project called the, the Ocean Cleanup Project. They're leaving the land right now and driving a gigantic boom out into the middle of the ocean to try to clean up the garbage patch. And I wish them luck. And then there is Mr. Trash Wheel. And for those of you that aren't, aren't familiar with these trash wheels in Baltimore, it's a great idea. They sit at the end of river mouths and they collect the trash before it goes out into the ocean. 
So lots of way to clean up. But it always comes back to that question of what can you do, right? What can you do in your home? And so I would encourage you to think about this issue globally, as I just described, but to act locally. <clears throat> so what does that mean? Do things that you can do right at home. So lead a cleanup in your region, and you can share your data via Ocean Conservancy or the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Collect that data and share it on a database using NOAA's protocols or other protocols out there to share the data in a big group. Educate others about the issue. So today, if I tell 200 of you and you each tell one more person, we've told 400 people by just having this conversation. Reduce your single-use plastic footprint. Think about when you make your lunches, maybe using less Ziploc bags or, or disposable water bottles, and instead using a reusable water bottle and maybe some Tupperware. And always, always, when you can, recycle. Reduce your use where you can, reuse something, or refuse plastic if you don't need it. When I go to a restaurant, sometimes I just tell them, you can skip the straw. I don't need the straw. And what I really like to encourage, because we all have a voice in our great societies, is to write a letter to your local government about local management strategies in your reason, region. And as kids, you guys can do this better than anyone because they will listen to you. I have seen governments move into action because kids are telling them what they care about. And so really, this is your world, and you can tell us how to clean it up for you. So our goal all together is to try to get to this clean, clean environment, right? To get from these areas where we have these dirty beaches to beaches that are clean so that when we go on vacation, we don't have to look at other people's waste. So I want to thank you for listening. And I think we have lots of time for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Is that right, Jesse? Yep, you're great. Thank you so, so much, Chelsea. That was awesome. Uh, just so you know, too, Life Magazine disbanded in the year 2000. So long time. All no right. longer existing. No longer existing. Okay, good All to right. know. <laughs> Let's start with Miss Weber's Bob. Come on up. You guys have a question? Do you want to ask your question? Go up to the, go up to the, who wants to ask that one? Take your time, guys. Go ahead. Sorry, that went so fast, we weren't quite ready. That's okay. Uh, how much fun is it to look at this stuff that you do? How much fun is it? You know what? It's a lot of fun. So I like your question because a lot of people ask me how sad is it? And the reality is, sure, it is kind of sad to think about this pollution, but at the same time, it is really fun to be able to do work that helps solve an issue, and it is really fun to be out in the ocean and look at the beautiful blue seas or be out in the Arctic sea ice or be out on the lake. So my job is a blast, and I am thankful every day that I actually get to do this for a living. For what it's worth, too, that's a great question. You're literally the first person ever to ask a question about fun when the person's topic was sort of sad. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> yeah, it was a great question. Never happened before. History of exploring those in your pants. Uh, all right, let's head to San Antonio. So your microphone is demuted in theory, but for some reason it has you guys as muted. So maybe come up to the front, little symbol microphone at the top, and then you guys can ask a question if you want. I don't know why it's doing that but if you figure it out you're free to ask your question no it's still muted it's still muted for some reason i don't know why i can't demute it so try if you guys come to the front little microphone symbol check that you know what i'll come back to you guys in a minute i'll ask another question and then we'll come back to you and, and see if we can get that working but we'll go to mr hollis's class you guys have a question you grade nine students totally not grade fours <laughs> All right, there you go. Uh, what kind of biodegradable products have or are being developed for litter and uh, pollution? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now, um, a lot of the materials that are out there on the market are not super biodegradable. So like those, um, 
when you go to a barbecue sometimes or you go to a restaurant and they have a cup that says compostable, you want to look closely and see if it's industrially compostable only because that means it has to go to a facility that heats it up very, very hot to compost it. You can't put it in your backyard. But there are people working on products that are made from marine microbes or made from mushrooms that degrade much easier. Right now, they are not to scale, meaning they exist, but they haven't gotten an investor or somebody to say, that's a great idea. I'm going to give you $2 million or whatever it is to build your factory to produce this so we can sell it in the stores. So what we need to be doing right now is more, um, I think some of those inventions are there and it's more asking for those products to be put on the market in a big way. But I think we will get there for some materials that just can't be recycled, like cling wrap and um, like the little bags, they call them sachets, but they're like the little bags for snacks or the bags that wrap around the cutlery. Those are very hard to recycle. So those materials, perfect for that solution. And I think we'll get there. Awesome. That's a great right. question. Back to San Antonio. So again, guys, right now, for whatever reason, it's keeping you guys muted. I don't know what's happening. That doesn't often happen. So if we can't figure it out, there's a little blue square in the top left of your screen, and you can type in a question there, and I'll just pass it along to Chelsea directly, okay? So if you figure it out with a mic, great, but otherwise you can just type it. In the meantime, we'll head to Brampton. If you guys have a question, come on up. What's the estimate on how long uh, will it take to cool on the ocean? I think your voice cut out exactly on the keyword I needed for that question. Can yeah. you repeat it? How long is the estimate on uh, how, how long will it take to like clean up all the plastic from the ocean? How long will it take to clean it up? Yeah. Probably a long time. And I think the main problem is it would be really hard and it would take a lot of energy. And so what I usually tell people is that the best way probably to use our energy is to try to reduce the amount going in. Not that it's not a good idea to clean it up, but if we stop the amount going in, then every time we do a beach cleanup, we are cleaning up the ocean because a lot of that trash and litter washes back up on shorelines. It's hard to clean it up from the deep sea. I'm not sure that we'll ever do that, but I think it's really important that we turn off the tap going in before we spend a lot of effort cleaning it up from the middle of the ocean. Excellent. All right, let's go to Miss Anderson's class. Just come on up, guys. Do you mute your mic at the top? <laughs> it's like eight students that want to ask a question. <laughs> yeah. And there you go. You're good. Why did you choose uh, being a uh, plastic biology for the ocean? instead of other jobs? Instead of other jobs, it's a good question. I think I decided that, and that when I was young, I didn't, I wanted to do something that would help the environment. So I always really cared about nature and the outside, and I wanted to do something that helped the environment. Um, growing up, my mom used to take us to uh, volunteer for recycling groups, and so we would go and pick up trash on the streets of Tucson, Arizona, where I grew up. And uh, we would go and help the recycling um, company sort. And so I got really interested in waste. And when then, when I got to college, I took a marine science course and I loved it. And so I thought, what better to com way to combine my love of the ocean and also freshwater environments with my interest in waste and plastic and put it together and become a scientist. And being a scientist is a lot of fun. I mean, we get to work outside. We get to work directly on issues that inform governments. I get to work with students, which is a lot of fun. And I do something different almost every day, so I'm never bored. So I really love what I do. Um, and it's hard to say why exactly I chose it, but I think those are all the reasons put together why I do what I do. Nice. Because it takes a little bit of effort to get the, the demuted classes on, Miss Anderson's class, if you guys want to ask a second question, go right ahead. You want to have a second one? Off your head? Anyone? Yeah. How long did it take you to become um, a scientist? Mm. So I went to school just like you, and I continued in school through high school. Then I went to university, and that usually takes about four or five years. 
Um, then I did a PhD, which took another five years. But by then, I was already a scientist. So when you're doing your PhD, that's when I was out in the garbage patch. So I spent five years doing my PhD. And then I spent three years as a postdoc, which just is after your PhD, before you become a professor. But I would say during all of that, I was a scientist. So I really think it took me my entire undergraduate career. And then I launched into working on my own projects. So just for the classes to know, so how old are you when you're done your undergraduate? 18. Okay. No. No. no you, I finished high school and you're 18. You're, you're a child prodigy. Normally you're 22. <laughs> Perfect. Let's go back to San Antonio. It looks like the mic's working. So if you guys want to ask a question. Ask oh, really? Nothing else. Um, if you see plastic, like, stuck or, like... If you see um, animals that have plastic, like stuck in their mouth, question. do you take them somewhere, like to a hospital? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are animal hospitals and groups. So, like if you've heard of SeaWorld, that actually have these animal rescue centers. And so often, if you're out in the ocean and you see an animal injured, there's a number that you can call. And that, and that those people will come out and rescue that animal. So it's a bit dangerous to try to clear it yourself. But for example, I used to work on whale watching boats. And one time we did see a whale entangled by plastic rope. We called that number. We hung by the whale. They came out. They cut it off. And the whale was set free. So absolutely there are people that do this for their job. And you know that's probably a pretty fun job too. So just a, a note on that, actually, we work with a group called the Turtle Hospital. We do tons of hangouts with them, and that is what they do. People rescue turtles and bring them in, and they take the plastic off them. They fix any medical problems they have. So it is a very fun job, and they love it. All right, let's go back. You know what? You guys, if you have a second question in San Antonio, go right ahead. I know it's been a little trouble to get you guys on, so uh, go for it. Why does, the trash... Why does the trash affect the smell? Why does it what? Why does the trash affect the smell? Like, why does trash smell bad? Yes. Yeah, well, because often our trash has rotting food in it, right? And so that's one reason. But in the middle of the ocean, the trash, the plastic that we pull out, actually smells really bad. And it's because animals start to live on it and around it. And then if they wash up on the beach, then they kind of rot in the sunlight. But the fact that the plastic, when it goes in the ocean, starts to grow life around it is actually one of the reasons why animals eat it. Because you wouldn't choose to just eat your water bottle. You know it doesn't taste good. But if your water bottle was surrounded by a hamburger or some other type of food, you might eat it by accident. So this smell is actually sometimes what leads animals to it. But why the trash just smells in general is generally because there's food waste and rotting food around it. that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's go to Miss Presley's class where someone is like right at the computer. <laughs> if you guys have a question, go right ahead. Okay. What's your question? Why do they call it a ghost net? That is a great question. Why do they call it a ghost net? They call it a ghost net because once the net is released from the boat or the ship and it's now floating around on its own, it's still fishing. So animals can still get caught in it, but there's no fishermen or fisher associated with it anymore. So it's a ghost net because the the fisher that's operating that net is now a ghost, right? Because it's not there anymore. And so that's why they call it a ghost net. Thank you. I wanted to ask that question too. <laughs> uh, okay. So we have a few more questions with classes here. I just want to note too, we've got some people watching on YouTube live. So Miss Stringham's class, for instance, if you guys want to send in a question, you can in the YouTube chat bar. So please do. But first, let's go to Miss Huddle's class in Virginia Beach. There's so many of you. Uh, so, yeah, just come on up, demute your mic, guys. Little microphone symbol, top of your screen, and then you'll be good. There you go. Um, do, do you ever find, like, sports stuff when you're, like, researching on plastic? Mm-hmm. So, recently, we did a cleanup in the Don River, which is a river in Toronto, and we found 55 balls, soccer balls, tennis balls, all kinds of balls. And we had no idea why, and we thought this was interesting. And it was right around the time of the World Cup. So we sent out a message on Twitter that we found 55 balls in the water. And FIFA, 
who runs the World Cup, actually tweeted back, people in Toronto must have been so excited about the World Cup but didn't know how to make sure their ball didn't land in the water. So, yes, we do find it, um, but not all the time. That is a great story. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go back to Miss Weber's class. If you guys have a second question, come on up. Barbie. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Why did you develop the web the website? Why did you develop the website? The website that we have in our for our lab group? Yeah. Um mostly to basically allow people to come and see what we're doing and ask us questions because it's really important for me as a researcher to reach out to the community and not just do my science in the lab and then write papers for other scientists but we really care about working with the local community and then also having people around the world be able to ask us questions like you for example so by having a website we can get emails from people who are curious about the issue and we can also if we have events like we're doing a cleanup in a few weeks we can put it on the website so people know to come join us. So I think a website's a really good way for me to be able to communicate with the public, but also to attract new students and researchers to my lab and my research group. Awesome. Great question. Before we go on to the next question, I just want to say to all the classes, it's been really great seeing how confident all your students are coming up and asking questions, especially so early in the school year that like never happens. So it's really impressive. Well done, teachers. Uh, let's go to Mr. Hollis's class. You guys yeah. Do you guys have a second question? If not, we can come back. We will come back. We promise. Uh, let's go back to Brampton. And be you and you should be good. Yep, that's Maybe we'll come back. What? Oh, now you started asking after I muted. There we go. Try again. Yep. What type of new technology is being to help the challenge? What type of new technology is being developed to help manage the challenge? Uh, a lot of different things. So there are new technologies for cleanup. So like that project I was saying that's going out into the middle of the ocean now. Um, those trash wheels and different things that sit at like storm drains or river mouths to clean up the trash. There are people trying to invent new ways to sort our waste for recycling. Um, different types of plastics that are more biodegradable or more sustainable. Um, a lot of technologies and I think and just new waste management strategies. So for example, there are people trying to turn plastic back into what plastic is originally made out of, which is oil, in a safe way so that we can truly reuse that material over and over again. Awesome. All right, we'll wrap it up with the final three questions. Let's go first to Miss Presley's class. Go right ahead, guys. Okay, ready? Ask yeah. Hello. Okay. How, how do you help a city to stop littering? The city. You know why I love that question? Because I honestly think that the best place to work on this issue is in the city because waste is managed very locally. So you can ask your local government to think about their strategy. So one is to maybe eliminate or reduce the use of some single use items in the city. Another one is to have more litter bins or trash bins and recycling bins around the community to be able to put more in your recycle bin, know what types of plastics can go in there, um, and then also to do outreach programs to educate all the people in the community about the materials we interact with. So there's so much we can do in a city, and I think the city is the best level to act on this issue. Outstanding. All right, I'm going to pass along a question from a group watching online. We've got Ms. Smith's grade fives in Burlington, Ontario. Uh, where have you traveled in the world for your work? What country? No. Today I'm traveling to Burlington, Ontario uh, to go to the Canadian Center for Inland Waters. Um, but I have traveled to the middle of the North Pacific to this garbage patch. I have traveled across the South Atlantic to look in the plastic in the South Atlantic. I've been to the Canadian Arctic, which is beautiful. Um, I've been in streams and landfills and wastewater treatment plants around Canada and the United States. 
Um, and then I've been to lots of places for conferences, like Africa and Russia and Korea. And But in terms of field work, I think I did some work in San Diego. I think those are most of the places that I have been to. Woo! Is that the short list? Holy... All right. That's also what's fun about being a scientist, but you do fly a lot. Yeah. It makes you tired. Well, today it's just Burlington. You, you don't have to fly there. Yeah, but I hope it stops raining. All right. <laughs> we'll wrap it up with Miss Anderson's class. If you guys want to do one last question, go right ahead. Yeah. Oh, my God. I need it. Yep, you're good. No, you're good. Oh, good. Go. Yeah. When did they discover the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? In 1998. So Captain Charles Moore, who is somebody who sailed a lot, discovered some plastic on his route, started to try to understand more about the issue. And it wasn't until eight years that the Los Angeles Times published it and it became much more publicly known. But he discovered it in 1998. What year were you born? <laughs> what, what, wait, let's go back. We have to be you to find out what year were you born? 2008. Yeah, so 10 years before you were born. Thank you for making both of us feel so old uh, to wrap up the hangout. Uh, all right, so guys, at the end of every hangout, what we do is I'm going to demute everyone's microphone. So Ms. Weber's class, Mr. Hollis's class, uh, Ms. Caracas's class, Ms. Anderson's class, everyone, if you could join us and say a big thank you to Chelsea. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. That was a great first hangout to kick off our Ocean Plastics Month. Uh, we hope to have you all back. Chelsea, that was wonderful. Thanks so much for joining us. No problem. Thank you. All right, guys. Have, have a, a great day.